probe control to probe one. Are you all right, Miss Cook? I've got three sets of vital signs. All high, ready to fight. Lockwood, it's your option. But in the interest of the mission, please try to avoid beating anyone to a pulp. Or vice versa. Join Rick Brooks and Mike Kogel as they explore the TV of the 70s and 80s through hand-picked episodes of their favorite and not-so-favorite series. And welcome to the Battle of the Network shows, and this is Mike, here with Rick, and today we're going to talk about uh, kind of a rarity show. We'd like to bring you some of those. And in a way, this is the show, one of the shows that I think inspired us to do this podcast. That's definitely fair to say. Just yes. talking about it a lot. And uh, So this show is called Search, and it's from 1972. Mm-hmm. Single season. Yeah. And uh, we're probably going to spend a lot of time talking about the show itself, since most of you don't know about it. We will say it's available on DVD through the Warner Archive, and it is often on their uh, streaming platform, Warner Instant. Yeah, it dipped off uh, for a while, but it's it's been on there pretty consistently. So if you get their streaming service, uh, check it out. It, it may be available, all episodes. And, uh, well, the, the TV movie that, that launched yeah, it right. and, and started the whole thing, um, that's off and on. on it, it's definitely available on DVD, but it's also on Warner Archive Instant sometimes as well. So Search is kind of, I, I would call it a, a spy-fi show. So yes, a, a good way to put it. Mix of espionage and a little bit of, uh, at the time, was science fiction. Right. Um, now a lot of it is like uh, almost quaint in, <laughs> yeah, and and in, in its I think accuracy that. Uh, so, it's about a private security group called World Securities that uh, sends these agents out. They're called probes. They get hired to do these jobs. You know, find missing people, find things, stolen goods, things like that. And, uh, you know, that's not that exciting necessarily. But then added on to it is all this sort of technical stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the the agents carry with them, uh, they call it a scanner, which is a little round thing that can either magnetically fix itself to a ring or because it's the 70s, a yeah. medallion. Yes. <laughs> I prefer the medallion. <laughs> <I but yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> or they can just hold it up or whatever. And, and it, it's a, they call it a, a, what a, a miniaturized TV scanner or something. Yeah, there's some kind of... Uh... But basically, it's, it, I mean, it's an iPhone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. It's a camera. It's a video camera that sends live footage back to... Uh, the home base. Uh-huh. Um, it is. It can do more because it also sends um, medical telemetry, not just of the the wearer, but of people around it. It does like infrared. It, I think there's an X-ray thing that they use in some episodes to help pick locks. I, I don't think. Is it receiving audio or is it just the? Because the, the the agents also have like an audio yeah, thing so implanted in their head. Yeah, I guess it seems like. Um... I guess, yeah. I think it is. I think it has radio transmission. Yeah, it must. Yeah. It must, because I think that's how they used to... That's how they... To go back the other way. Yeah, Yeah, so they must receive as well. The people in the thing are seeing a lot of what the agent is seeing and seeing how he's reacting to things. Yes, they're very big on telemetry. Yeah, (laughs) and feeding him information from uh, a giant resource of tape data banks... (laughs) Yeah. A.K.A. the Internet. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, and they have all, all the stations, and they're accessing those things, and different people on this crew have different responsibilities, and which all, you know, kind of like half the shows on TV now have that general setup of right, like a either team. a team in the field with one person in the back, one or two people, or <laughs> one or two people out in the thing, and if yeah. a team back in the thing talking back and forth and giving information and you know any of your cw superhero shows have that and uh, person of interest had that the ncis shows kind of have a version of that correct 
Yeah, and in this case, they've got like sort of a pseudo scientific look because they, you know, they kind of wear like the white coats and stuff, right. and and, yeah. and and it looks in the early episodes, it's like lit. Yeah, really, like the room is basically dark, and then there's this red lighting on everything. Yeah, and it looks really cool. Yeah, it, it it does. It's it's a good job of uh, set design and sort of maximizing space and and probably maximizing budget as well. Yeah, and the the director there, at least on all the missions you see on the show, is played by the great Burgess Meredith from Batman and how many Twilight Zones and yeah, the, of course Rocky, Mice and Men and the Rocky movies. Yeah. And yes. Uh, Grumpy old man, <laughs> legendary actor. Yeah, uh, and, and then there's a, kind of a rotating crew of people, other people there, and uh, and speaking of rotating, this had, uh, I guess, not the first show to do this, but still a unique thing—a rotating cast of leads. There yeah. were like three leads who were all pretty well known. Yeah, it was like a like a wheel show, so you'd rotate the so e- each week it could be like a different person, and I guess they would do that to. Uh, now, in this case, like in some shows that would do that, like uh, like NBC did that with like their uh, Columbo and McMillan and Wife and right. kind of that mystery movie. Yeah. And then there was a show, Name of the Game, right, which starred one of the the people that was on. But now on that one, I think now I I've only seen bits of that one. That that yeah. one hasn't been on. It actually has been on, but I haven't seen it. Um, that one, I think it was like the the setup was the same, but they had rotating like casts and like. Everything was different about the the individual components of the wheel. Mm. Whereas this one, the only thing that really changes is the lead. Right. And that is a big change because the personality of the lead and maybe the style. But everybody else, like Burgess Meredith is still there and the other yeah. people. And the, the basic structure of the show, you know, in front of and behind the camera remains the same. Right. Like that, what little I read about that name of the game, which I didn't know about till last night. Uh, I guess they were connected by a common... Like a, they all worked for the same company yes, or something. Yes, it was like all a magazine, I think, or something like. A, yeah, they were. Yeah, journalists. So that one had uh, like Gene Barry, and so in that case, though, if you're dividing up, I can see how, especially because that was a 90 minute show, I believe. Okay. So if you're doing a 90 minute show, and and like those NBC ones, mystery movies, it makes sense to to do this because you can rotate and and make sure that you get enough episodes. Yeah. Like in this one, I'm not sure exactly what the advantage was, or if it was just something with the availability of the actors. Or if they just liked the concept and thought it was right. I mean, there was also um, another one I want to mention. I don't know if you were gonna, but the the bold ones was kind of mm-hmm. like around this era. It was like the the bold ones, doctors, the bold ones, the new lawyers, the bold ones. <laughs> like there was a police one, you know, and they had these sort of rotating things. I oh, believe okay. so. There was the bold ones umbrella, and then they had I different. See. Now that and that again was like different production people, different casts. I mean, obviously because there were different settings. Yeah. So search is sort of like those, and, and I guess a little unique too, in the sense that they're basically just swapping out the lead. Right. Uh, I mean, it's possible they could have been filming like the the mission parts simultaneously or with different crews or something. True. True. Or maybe it was just like these actors all they didn't want to commit to a whole season. That could be. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it was probably a lot easier. You're right, because like the the back at control with the Burgess Meredith, those scenes would have been easy to do. Like in a big block. Yeah. As opposed to these ones where they go out in the field and actually doing stuff and having like car chases or whatever and action scenes. So. Right. And, you know, sometimes the, the agents are in the back in the room with them, like at the beginning of the episode yeah, or right. something. They, but, to set up the thing. But yeah. not always. Sometimes they're called True. in from, they're already out in the field. And, True. And the, and the show is edited, of course, to make it seem like it's all one thing. But for all yeah. we know, how often was, you know, were they really talking to Burgess Meredith? They're, right. <laughs> Maybe it was him. Maybe he's like, I, d- I, I don't want to act with <laughs> name actors. Yeah. Oh. Just put me in a room with a bunch of supporting actors. Yeah. Well, Those are my people. That kind of disappoint me and delight me at the same time, but <laughs> I'm not sure. But yeah, so it was an interesting concept. Yeah. These three leads, first, uh, Hugh O'Brien. The as, man. As Lockwood. And he's going to be in the episode we talk about. Yeah. And what like what, what was his claim to fame? Pro- probably for like TV. I mean, this show doesn't come up from very much in his resume. It's Wyatt Earp, I would say, is maybe most okay. known for, and he was on like westerns and known for that. And we just lost him uh, last last year as we were doing this. But yeah, uh, lived to a ripe old age and did a lot of charity his later years, I guess. But uh, uh, yeah, I didn't know him until before watching this show. I would not have uh, guessed at his persona in this. Hmm. in this show because I thought of him more as like Wyatt Earp as like you know a lawman square jawed western kind of guy but yeah. not not quite what we get in here but <laughs> right. but he's he's my favorite of the three yeah. characters definitely Hugh Lockwood yes yeah. then there's um, Doug McClure as C.R. Grover yeah 
did and now when I looked up Burgess Meredith or I was looking at it, his uh they always just call him Cameron. But his he's V C R Cameron. Uh you, what are you suggesting there? I don't know. It's the Leslie mm. Stevens, the creator, had an obsession with the initial CR. Yeah. Oh, I thought maybe there's some kind of link between uh, I, I Grover think, and Cameron. No. Oh, okay. I, it's just a Grover annoys him. But. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and he's from he he did westerns too. Right? Doug McClure. Yeah, he was in the Virginian. Doug McClure was in a lot of stuff, but yeah. I'm not sure what his fa- maybe the Virginian might be his most famous show too. He was on that for years. I know. Yeah. What was that show Trent he did with Shatner? Oh, Barbary Coast was yeah. in like the mid '70s, okay. I think. So that, that would have been after this, and right. had a lot of uh, shows that didn't last long, I believe. But yeah, Doug McClure was movies and TV for yeah for quite a long run there. And no, he he died kind of young ish. Uh, I mean, like '59 or something. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. But he he was in the I think his last role was in the Maverick movie as one of the <laughs> like there were a bunch of old cowboy actors in that. Hmm. Um, yeah, and, and his character is sort of a. Uh, Almost like a surfer dude kind of guy. Yeah, he's a bit of a <laughs> a goof. Yeah, didn't they? Who was it that called him a savant? Oh, uh, right. And when did was that actually on the show? No, I think there was to? something else. Like, okay. like in yeah, <laughs> <laughs> As some sort of like. Did they use the word idiot too, or I, I don't, I don't or know. surfer savant or yeah. some yeah? He's definitely yeah. He's he's winging it through things, hmm. and he seems like he's the junior member. Although, uh, in the series, you get a sense, you meet other agents, too. Yeah. There's definitely a, a sense of a world. Yeah, they focus on that. these three. And also, yeah, and although there's the scienti- the pseudo-scientific aspect of it, the really, the technological aspect, there's also yeah. a big bureaucracy to this world security. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As there's, an, there's an executive structure, and throughout this, the, the episodes, you see they, there's, like, these internal politics mm-hmm. and things like that. So even Cameron... He's kind of like the field director, right. but he's got to answer to people upstairs and kind of deal with the bureaucracy aspect of yeah. it, too, which is kind of funny. Like Dr. Barnett. Uh, yes, we do hear about that. Uh, so I don't know if he's the guy that came up with the the science of this or or what, but uh, yeah. Then Tony Franciosa as Nick Bianco. So he was on Name of the Game for yeah. a couple seasons in a lot of movies and things. And in I, rem- I, I didn't know it was him because I always get his name confused with a couple other names uh, but he was the finder of lost loves the finder of lost 80s. loves yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which i kind of watched some yeah interesting yeah uh he was the finder of lost loves he was you know yeah. what i'm because I'm, i would have thought it was james francis right yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> there you go right. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny uh, <laughs> uh okay well yeah so he plays yeah, yeah. nick uh, nick bianco nick bianco and he's like a retired ex-cop yeah, and he's kind of a street wa- street smart. Yeah. Definitely has a swagger to him. Right. And they all have designations that I can't remember right now. Like, Lockwood is Probe 1. Yeah. I don't remember Grover's. It's some, like, you know, Probe Junior or something. <laughs> <laughs> and and then he's got, like, some fancy title, too. Yeah. Like, that he's, like, a special... He, he only does certain kind of cases. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. I guess one's involving the underworld. And, yeah. You know. And, yeah, he's... He, uh, He's tough. He's a tough guy. Yeah, but they all get into fisticuffs. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they're all they're all handy with their their hands if they need to be. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's definitely some some action in the show. It's not just you know there's there's the the interaction. Uh, there's the scientific stuff, the spy stuff, the intrigue stuff, and and definitely uh, they they fit in some action. So I guess they did spend some money on the show. Yeah, and of course, ladies. Oh yeah. Both Couldn't in the have, field and, and yeah. out in the out in the field and, and back home. That's right. <laughs> and early seventies fashion. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes. Medallions we already mentioned. Grown men with <laughs> letting their hair out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that a show that, that is so forward thinking with technology is such a time capsule, but it really right. is. <laughs> And some of the attitudes, you know, and everything. Yes, it's yeah. definitely of its time in a good way, though. In a good way, and like it's uh, like in this episode and some other episodes, we get kind of little uh, references to like feminism and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, so it's it, it, yeah, it's very of its time, but uh, and the the uh, like the group of people working in the thing are uh, in the home base, kind of like a diverse group there that's a good point yes they're ethnically diverse and there's there's women and men yeah and they're all doing you know these 
high tech jobs. Yeah. Now there's there's a what would be considered a problematic uh, part at the beginning of this this episode uh, today that we can talk about, but um, it's not like they just have a secretary. No. In the background, you know, they have the women are doing actually important jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, there's a man. I think well, there's the guys doing like linguistic stuff. Right. Which. You could easily see like them giving the woman that kind of. It seems like a more stereotypically feminine thing, but yeah. but in the in this show they've got men doing that kind of stuff too. So they, they do a pretty good job with that, especially as the series goes on, yeah. and they kind of get away from some of what they do in this episode. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and even see like I, there was one episode where like I think Mary Fran played a one of the probe agents in the field. Right. And, right. Yeah. That's kind of cool. It's it's one of those things that I think um, we've touched on a little bit that. Like it seemed like in the seventies there was actually a push towards diversity that kind of started to go away in the eighties and into the nineties and yeah in the eighties it it seemed like there's some of these shows in the seventies where diversity is like a cast of diverse people, whereas in the eighties it became okay, we'll give African Americans their own show right or or have them with you know clashing with white people and have the shows kind of be about that, but yeah this or, is just or then even like you know once Fox showed up. Yeah. The networks could give up on that and yeah. like shift it over right, to Fox. Right. And once UPN and the WB showed up, Fox could give up on it. And Right. And the diversity on a show like Search, it's, it's not even mentioned at all. No. You know, it's just there. So yeah. you don't make a thing out, out of that. Exactly. So World Securities is an uh, equal employment organization, clearly. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, you originally told me about this show. I don't know if you had seen it yet, but I was like trying yeah. out the Warner Instant and then. This is the thing that kept me on the Warner Instant for quite a while. <laughs> right, because you saw the movie first, right? Yeah. And told me how great the movie was. Which is called Probe. Yeah. I guess they had to change that. Yeah, the series was going to be Probe, and then they changed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the movie sort of introduced the setup, and it also has Lockwood. Right, yeah. And then they, then we get into the series with like this first episode. But yeah, you, you were the one that with the Trailblazer, and once you told me, <laughs> you started telling me things about this, this series. Yeah. And uh, how great it was, and I watched the movie, and I got hooked too and, and after that it was like oh great you know the whole series is available too and it's got great music and all oh, the the theme the song is, is awesome it's by now this was created by leslie stevens yeah who created the outer limits right and yeah. uh the same composer i think that did the outer limits uh music composed this one okay. it's a totally different song but oh man it's great it's got you know you just there should be like a band called the search orchestra <laughs> To just perform this, you know, live yeah. because I'd love to hear it. You know, it's right. got horns, it's got strings. Yeah. Ah, oh, great, great song. It's all instrumental. Yeah. But that and combined with the the credits mm-hmm. that introduce the cast and they they introduce they have like the names of all the leads in the credits. Right. And then they say tonight, you know, and they have like a little circle that has yeah. the, like the <laughs> almost like the logo, like right. a, a shot of that actor. Yeah. And, and just imagine. I mean, can you imagine what it was like back then? I mean, you had like TV listings and TV guide, but for a lot of people, unlike today, it would probably be a surprise yeah. because they didn't do it, at least according to the, the order of the episodes that we watched them on Warner Instant. They didn't do just all straight alternating. No. You could go like three weeks without seeing you know Grover or, or Lockwood or something. So yeah. it might be a surprise. You're like, tonight's episode, and then you'd be kind of waiting like, oh, <sighs> Lockwood, yeah. You know? right, right. Uh, Grover. Mind you, I wasn't disappointed to see Grover or Bianco. But no. Just Lockwood is, is so cool that I'd, I'd love to see 23 Lockwood episodes or however many it was. But yeah. I, I like them all, but I, I really love the, the Lockwood episodes best. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and, and Leslie Stevens also, did, at least he wrote the the pilot movie for the Buck Rogers TV show and mm. um, yeah, a bunch of other stuff. He, well, I think I was telling you about this a little bit. So he wrote this book called Est, the Steersman Hand, Steersman's Handbook or something like that. It is like a sp- new agey speculative something. Yeah, rather. Est was like a. But it has nothing to do with Est the. The, the program. The self help uh, program. Other the than like. Uh... Right, that there are secondhand accounts that the that the guy who founded that named it after this book, and it's even in the book is like lower all lowercase letters, and that's how. It... I wish somebody would have ripped off this show and made more shows like that instead yeah. of ripping off his Est book and right. coming up with that dumb <laughs> Est. <laughs> Somebody was going to rip Leslie Stevens off. Right. Man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but he's, I mean, yeah, some big credits. And, for him. and uh, I saw, you know, the, also in the credits, uh, producer Robert Justman, who is big in Star Trek, okay. uh, worked very closely with Gene Roddenberry. And I've read some stuff that he's written about working on Star Trek. He got frustrated with some of, like, the 
dealings with the network and, and some budget issues. So he had experience with producing shows like complex shows and mm-hmm. then kind of coming up. So, you know, it's, it's, I guess there's no wonder why somebody maybe sought him out to, to work on this. He probably had a big influence. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how hands on he was with this, but I did see his name in the credits too, which was interesting, but they put out some good, uh, good product. Yeah, so we we've got to we've got to convince everybody why this show is so cool. Because <laughs> yeah. if we do one thing with this podcast, it's it's to get people to get into this show, <laughs> right? And if we do two things, it's to get someone to hire me to write a comic book adaptation of this show. Excellent. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, it would totally lend itself to a comic book uh, adaptation. Of yeah. It. So if anybody's listening who has the money to get the rights, to- <laughs> yes, call me. Yeah, uh, you don't know my phone number, <laughs> but. You'll there are email out. ways to contact us. Yeah. Yeah. And I would like uh, some money related to that idea, too. <laughs> right. So call me, too. Yeah. So well, I guess we should get into this episode, then. Yes, the Murrow Disappearance. Murrow Disappearance. Which I believe aired Wednesday, September 13th, 1972. Wow. On the NBC television network. Of note. This might be the first show we've done where neither of us was uh, yet alive. Yes. So. That is that is a, a fact. Uh, this this is the oldest show that we have uh, yet done. Yeah. yeah, it still feels fresh today. It does, even though we just talked for five minutes about how dated it was. <laughs> no, it's it definitely not dated. It's 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 a time capsule, I would say, not dated. Right. So yeah, the Murrow dis- disappearance. As far as like going through the show, I I don't know if I can really go through the plot because even not just watch the show, <laughs> what stands out to me, it's totally not the actual plot. I mean, right. it's basically like. Lockwood does cool things. Lockwood gets an assignment. Uh-huh. He does cool things. Yeah. It's him bickering with uh, Cameron, with Burgess Meredith. Uh-huh. It's him being suave with the ladies. Yeah. It's him being cocky with the people he's going up against in the field. Right. And there you have it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the show, and it's great. Yeah. It's glorious. <laughs> I can try. Let me... This guy, Murrow, disappears. Yeah. In Washington. Yes. Uh, they send Lockwood... They get hired by a mysterious figure, someone high up in the government. Yeah, that doesn't, yeah. Who, who tells them, we know that because he's sitting in front of a giant seal. Yeah. <laughs> but he's he's uh, done the news thing and like his face is in shadows and his voice is distorted. Right, definitely. So they send uh, Lockwood to this private club, the Diplomatic Legations Country Club. Yeah, it's very swank. Yeah. And he, um, they show him driving around 1950s Washington, D.C. <laughs> a lot of cars with big fins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yep. Uh, and he, they get him into this club and, um, basically he finds out that someone at the club is, is that they're, they're poker games or card games and they're, you know, watching it and there's a guy with like, you know, glasses with a radio in them and they're cheating. Hmm. And, cheating the people who play it it uh turns out this murrow guy was doing that and lost a lot of money and this other guy is now losing a lot of money they both work for the same department there's another guy this third guy (laughs) hangs around there who also works for the government but in hr and it turns out not only did he set all this up basically he's picking people who shouldn't even have these high government jobs because they're gambling addicts so that he can rip them off and loan them money yeah and is somehow in cahoots with foreign agents. Yeah. They, that, they don't that useful, <laughs> usefully vague phrase, foreign agents. Yeah. And uh, it turns out he's also the guy that hired them as almost like a, like hiring a security company to check out your, yeah. uh, your security system. Something that you may to uh, break encounter into your house. elsewhere in this season of Battle of the Network. Shows, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. So it's a nice twist at the end. Yeah. Uh, although they kind of do set it up, but I, you know, I had seen it before and I kind of forgot. So yeah, yeah. they're like, oh yeah, okay, yeah. that's a good twist. That guy, by the way, this is played by uh, Maurice Evans, who played Doctor Zayas in Planet of the Apes. Yeah, I want to sing the the song from The Simpsons, uh, <laughs> Planet of the Apes, but I'm I've not going that. to do that. But yeah, and. Uh, also at the club is uh, Larry Tate from TV's Larry Tate from Bewitched, uh, David White. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's Mr. Llewellyn. Yeah, the uh, sort of, um, yeah, I'm not sure how to describe him. I mean, everybody in that club is a little. Uh, yeah, he's he's involved in the skimming of the money. Yeah. And Lockwood has interactions with a, a 
an intriguing female. That's right. Who was uh, played by? I did not write her, her name. Ke- down. I don't know how to it's say one. It. It's one name. Cap Capuccine or yeah. Capucini or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. She was in uh, the Pink Panther. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. So I, I didn't, I didn't I recognize her or anything, but right. She's. I mean, she's. It, it was. I mean, she's. I, th- I think she was. I looked it up. I think she's about like four in her early forties or yeah, just turned forty. Okay. This is made, and she's you know very glamorous and, and sophisticated. Mm-hmm. Definitely a match for Hugh Lockwood, who yeah. is suave enough to <laughs> demand you know the, the finest and that's right. Ladies. I mean, tempt her with peach melba. <laughs> yes, there's there's nothing quite like peach melba. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's basically trying to uh, you know he meets her and, and he's trying to get her to to go to dinner somewhere quiet. Quiet right. with him and, and get away. And she says she already has a dinner date. Yeah. And he says, "Well, maybe I can spare you some dessert, you know." And he's here. There's nothing quite like peach melba at midnight. <laughs> and then when she, you know, defers, demurs from the the peach yeah. melba, he says, "Well, tomorrow he's got cheesecake. It doesn't or chocolate eat, mousse. Or chocolate mousse. Sorry." She's like, "Oh, that's very tempting." <laughs> <laughs> something. Yeah, yeah, she's she's definitely uh, into him. I mean. We haven't said the word James Bond yet, but no. any resemblance to certain aspects of James Bond's character is entirely intentional, I believe. Yeah, but with an American yeah. edge to it. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Lockwood is uh, he's he's a charmer. Yeah, but he's not always co- like he loses his temper at the end too, which is pretty cool. He does, yeah, because he's he's mostly unflappable, yeah. and he has that that air about him, like he always knows what's going on. And when he's out in the field, he's t- when he's talking to, like. Burgess Meredith is the one that gets worked up. Yeah. And he's always, like, <laughs> agitated about stuff. Right. Lockwood. <laughs> you know, and, but, whereas Hugh is always, like, calm and just kind of, like, I mean, you know, just, like, when he, he does the bit about, um, you know, the ring, you know, he wants to get yeah. information on the ring somebody's wearing. Huh? Right. He can give you information, what, what universities, if it's a college ring, it can tell you what university, and he rattles off these things that you can learn from it. Yeah. It's like a calling card, you know, like an ID kind of thing, and he's very, like, calm about it, and. I, I like the way he he interacts with them. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. He does uh, when he's pushed, when he's when he's irritated. That's right. He smashes glasses. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> he also gets in some good karate action. Yeah, Lockwood. Uh, that, that's one thing we. I, I like the action scenes in this series. We, yeah. we do get the old, the stereotypical judo chop. Right. You know, quite often in this series, I think Grover does that too. I think yeah. Grover's a, a martial arts. Uh, yeah. I forget which martial art it is, but. There's something. one that he's an aficionado. I don't know if it's uh, taekwondo or right or judo. It's one of those that yeah. he, you know he, they actually say is Bianco's all fists. Yeah, Bianco's he learned in the streets. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there are a couple. There's a good like kind of car chase thing, uh, mostly in a parking lot, but <laughs> it's still pretty good. Yeah, it's it's still exciting. And uh, then yeah, like this sort of karate fight in a in a pretty small room. And then you get some techno technological stuff going on there, like like Lockwood, because he know that I like that he he knows his technology, so he he uh, pulls the cord out on the light in the room, so the room goes dark, and there are like a couple, there are like three people in there at that point, or they come in when it's dark, or I forget that, but um, and then he at home at the home base they use the infrared scanner to guide him out of the room and you hear stuff breaking and people yeah. punching each other and... <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool uh yeah it's cool now correct me if i'm wrong well maybe maybe this is wrong but it seemed to me like they they de-emphasized some of these elements as the show went on uh-huh. you know they they got, it became a little bit more conventional i think as the season went yeah. on and more of a like uh less of this those kind of things it was like they were showing them off early and for whatever reason, maybe they kind of ran out of steam, or they thought they maybe needed to to make it more of a conventional show because people were turned off by the sci-fi right. aspect of it. Like today, it doesn't seem like all that sci-fi. I mean, we've kind of no. sort of gone at it with sort of qualifying it. But back then, I guess maybe it was it was maybe it was sold more of as a sci-fi thing, and, and yeah. people and maybe it just was weird, like the high tech aspect was to be cutting back and forth between these two locations so much and yeah it, it kind of reminds me of like the first season of Mannix um, Mannix he was like there was this firm called Intertect uh-huh. which is like this big firm and Mannix would get his uh, uh, had a superior Joe Campanella played him and he kind of had to deal with the, the bureaucracy and stuff of this organization he'd go out in the field but they'd get all these like computer cards and that was the, the gimmick was <laughs> right. that the computers would basically give him these clues and, and they'd feed everything to the computers yeah. and then after that season 
you never heard from it again. I don't even know if they syndicated those first season ones huh. for years. But so people, a lot of people don't remember that. And then when Manix came out on DVD years ago, it was like, oh, the, look, forgot about this intertech stuff, you know, <laughs> that sort of quietly. So it'd be interesting if they went on with like a season two of Search, yeah. which we may find out someday in comic book form. But right. I, I wonder what direction they would have gone with some of this stuff, but. I think it's it's cool and it doesn't interfere no, at all. I, it enhances that gimmick of being out in the field. It makes it a special show. I f- feel like like watching some of those later episodes. Like I would get agitated if they didn't cut back hmm. to the to Cameron enough. Yeah, like it felt like I wasn't getting enough of that. I agree. To me, Cameron's an essential part of the show. Yeah. I mean, he's he's cantankerous. Even you know, in 1972, Burgess Meredith had the, <laughs> that down pat, yeah. that kind of character oh. and. You know, he's giving advice, you know, he's, he's, he's yeah, butting the, heads with the agents because, you know, he expects them to do everything they want. And he's, then, like, I think maybe in the movie it comes up a lot. Like, he's, he's like, really, like, wanting details on the food and the wine and <laughs> stuff. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> he's, like, all, like, living vicariously right. through them. Yeah. That's right, I forget. <laughs> that's and then it. he's, like, eating a crummy donut. And yeah, yeah. That, that's coffee think, from a styrofoam that cup. That might be in the, in the, in the movie. That, yeah. That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's just him and some of the other characters, the uh, one we'll talk about here, uh, like doing running commentary on what's going on and yeah. stuff that <laughs> yeah. certainly you don't get that any, in any other kind of setup Yeah, where maybe, someone's making fun of you while you're doing something. Yeah. Now granted, like in this, there may be less immediate peril in this episode, Yeah. but still, I mean, you got to get out in the field. Right. I mean, I guess in some of those like CSI shows, if you're solving a murder or whatever, I guess maybe it's inappropriate to be doing that the whole time, but... <laughs> But you're right, yeah, they're doing the, their little running commentary, making in-jokes, yeah. you know, and, and sly comments and stuff. And it, the, the agents are doing the same, like... Like back, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're actually is give and take and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and one, one other thing I want to say about Lockwood is, is just that kind of swagger he has. It, 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 it's very interesting, like, and at the time, he must have been, I guess he was in his 40s at the time, too. because yeah, he was like... In his late nineties when he died, right? Yeah, I mean he he's old when he died, but he was yeah. no spring chicken. So he's playing like kind of like a guy in the seventies that is maybe trying to look a little younger than he is, but yeah. he's not obnoxious about it. I mean, I, yeah. I, it seemed like Lockwood just seemed like he'd be a great guy to hang out with. Yeah. He knows he's the coolest guy in the world, but you don't hate him for it because he doesn't hold it against you. No. He definitely has like an air of uh, condescension in many cases, but it's it, it, it's a little smug, but yeah. I, I don't, it's hard to stay mad at him. I, I think he's very <laughs> likable, nevertheless. Yeah. But it's like he does little things like this to sort of make the character sort of seem a little cooler. Like one thing I wrote down, actually, he's, you know, try to get information and he just kind of says, uh, oh, th- this paperwork's a pain in the pancreas. You know, <laughs> you know it's just kind of like, like a little hipster spin, like a little hip spin on it. This, right. this paperwork's a pain in the pancreas. <laughs> You know, it's like what an, it's kind of an odd thing to say, but it's like a little slant that he says. You know, just yeah. And he kind of says it casually, but it just and he's his character is trying to make it sound like it's no big deal to say it either. But it's, it's just Lockwood does kind of stuff like that. He's not a real verbose guy all the time, but yeah. what he says, he makes it count. Yeah, and he's uh, like he's a rugged looking guy. That's a good one, yes. You know, but uh, yeah, I could see him being charming to women all the time. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. macho, but you know what? I'll bet. But he's not, yeah, it's not. You can see him having a bearskin rug, definitely, in in front of a fireplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And and like a, I mean, not that I want to go there, you know, but I mean, I could see it. I mean, yeah, you know what I mean. I don't want to hang out at his house. Yeah, he's probably got a cool house. He probably has like high end stereo equipment and everything, Mm -hmm. and and just he probably he gets Playboy magazine. (laughs) He actually does read the articles though, right? Yeah, and like Esquire and stuff, and and he stays up on it, but he doesn't need it. Yeah. It's kind of like he's the kind of guy that they get their advice, you know, that they use to, to do their trends and stuff like that, I, I picture. Yeah. Because he's, he's, he's the man. Right. And he's hip to things, whatever's going on. Yeah. Like in culture, he's, he's hip to it without, like, it's not a put on. He just. Right. He's not straining. He's just plugged uh, in, you know. I think he is, yeah. He knows. And he, he, knows, he knows people. He understands people. Like, that's what he does best in his job, I think. He can read these situations and the people. and Yeah, he can evaluate people quickly. He kind of has a good idea when people are lying. Yeah, and he gets the assistance from, you know, from uh, Cameron and his team. Yeah. Like, feed stuff through and feed it back to him. I mean, that's one cool element, too, is, like, a lot of times people have no idea 
where they're getting that information right. from, which gives them a, a big tactical advantage. Yeah. Because they can rattle off facts and stuff and just totally like stuns, you know, surprises people. Or, and he can get the upper hand sometimes by not revealing information. You know, these probe agents can, can have advantages over people. Right. Because they don't know about this this cool technology that they're using. Yeah, and then in other episodes, people do know and are using it against them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Uh, that, that's, which is equally interesting. Yeah, I mean, they yeah. kind of play with it both ways. Um, well, yeah, a lot of people like in this one, they, oh, oh he's, what a cool medallion this guy has. Right. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> if you see someone out there wearing a cool medallion, and then occasionally they fiddle with it and maybe then fiddle with their ring, yeah, you might... It's possible you're on camera. Yeah, it's not a nervous habit, folks. No. <laughs> it's not an affectation. It's uh, somebody uh, sending reports using telemetry. Do they all wear the medallion? Does some of them do that? Like, like it's their belt. Uh, I want to think. Uh, it was, yeah, I think one of them had it on like a belt one time. Yeah. The Lockwood has a cool belt buckle compartment that he keeps the lock picks in. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That he then attached, he like had a watch chain that he attached the lockpick to yeah. open this door. <laughs> he's, got, he's all set. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, did we, I, I kind of want to talk about too, uh, or just mention the fact that they're monitoring his, well, the telemetry. Right. They're monitoring his, like, physiological reactions to things in yeah. the field, I right. guess, uh, for efficiency, for safety, and that kind of thing. For which safety, is kind of unique. Yeah. They're monitoring his, his systems. Right. His, his heart rate. His and blood then they pressure. can do that to other people. Yeah. To help them out and say they're right, like a, they might be lying to you, like, right, like they're nervous or something. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and they also like in this one, they're able to find like when he has a th- his idea about the radio glasses for the cheating poker, like they're able to zero in on that radio frequency and kind yeah. of verify it for him and stuff. So the the other character in in the home base who makes the most impression and is also in the movie in like one other episode. Uh, her name's uh, Gloria it's Harding, right? Yeah. And she's played by Angel Tompkins, who it seems like was on the verge of being like a a potential movie star and then didn't quite ever go that way. Yeah, but. I'm not sure what happened. And do you happen to know why she left the show? No, I, I don't. I mean, it seemed like she was like an essential part of it. And then yeah. just she stopped showing, appearing in the episodes. Well, maybe uh, it just didn't work out or they couldn't afford it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, and she's only in Lockwood episodes. Mm-hmm. And there's even one episode where her like cousin fills in for her. Yeah, which they mention her, but yeah, like oh, you can just fill in for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I thought this it was a high tech job. Security, yeah, this the security firm. Yeah, now I like to think that the character uh, got promoted and is running her own operations. That that could be. They they definitely lay the groundwork for that in this episode, yeah. do they not? They do, and uh, you know. If there were a comic book, that that might be an aspect of the comic book. Yeah, you could you could go with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know why you know the actress left the show, and I don't you know know the ins and outs of why her career didn't go where it could have gone. But uh, yeah, and they they essentially replaced her with Ginny. Uh, is, is that her name? Is that her real name or the character? No, no, that's yeah, the, the brunette Keech. Yeah, 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 Keech. Keech. Right. Yeah, yeah. Cameron <laughs> calls her Keech. Her, her name Ginny Golden. Miss Keech. Her. Um, yeah, and she's actually seen in this episode, I think. Yeah, I think she's in a bunch of episodes. But, and then she sort of takes on that role as like the yeah, the main female right. working alongside Cameron. But, but yeah, Angel Tompkins was good too, but... Um, yeah, and what and then the character is good, because she's, she and Lockwood have like this thing, like... <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very James Bond money, money penny thing, although... Yeah. Unlike that, there's a chance it's more mutual on this one. Right. <laughs> it's like there's some tension there, but you think, uh, well, uh, it ain't going to be unresolved for long. Right. And there's a lot, a lot of teasing, and, and especially about any time is he's having a uptick in his right various uh, responses to ladies and yeah, and she gets jealous, which is not to the character's credit or not to the it, show's credit. They do it, yeah sort of reinforce some stereotypes there because they make her seem like the jealous one and right. And they sort of reinforce some some gender stereotypes there by making her fret over him. Yeah, and in this episode, she also there's a a point when the client calls. It's like the special code and code ten. If code ten, and if you're not up, you're not code ten level. Basically, if you're not an agent or the director, you you got to leave the room. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and the funny thing is, is like I forget what Lockwood says something like, "Okay, see you later, gentlemen," or something, yeah. and you know. <laughs> 
kind of you know he just like hangs around while they all have to leave and he's just like right. okay children go to go to recess you know we'll yeah. see it a, l- a little bit and and he gives this kind of like patronizing caress uh-huh. to um to gloria's shoulder and kind of maybe yeah. even like strokes her hair a little bit uh-huh. like it's it's really kind of kind of like uh it's definitely this patronizing male kind of thing which is yeah. kind of funny but he's just you know he doesn't mean to be mean he's just doing it you know and right and then there's the uh, she spring they sp- she, she springs the surprise that she doesn't have to leave after all. That's right. She's now in training. She convinced <laughs> Doctor Barnett over dinner and drinks, I believe. Yeah, there was an implication of stuff there. <laughs> yeah, and she makes the implication. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, mean, as we learn in her other episode, she's you know she can make choices for herself. She's a woman. She can do what she wants. I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying it was a little weird. Yeah, uh, that is, they that is that part. pretty much, uh, indicated that, that, that this is how she's on this track to a, uh, right. to promotion to a, to a higher position. Yeah. And it's not, it's like one, it's, uh, so this training, to, so she gets to sit in on this and eventually she will be doing what Cameron's doing. Uh, she also gets an immediate 27% raise. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'd like an immediate twenty seven percent raise. <laughs> well, uh, wouldn't we all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think I've gotten a total of a twenty seven percent. Easy now. No. Easy now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyways, though, but the um, the the odd thing about this is that Cameron doesn't know about this until right now at this moment when there's right. this code ten. It's like, oh, by the way, yeah. Uh, it's, it, this is totally like, total news to him. And he's. He's pretty put out. No, I think it was like Lockwood didn't know either. I don't. Think. No, I, <laughs> because that's why he gave like the little condescending thing because he was expecting like, okay, honey, time to leave now. And, yeah. But then she stays and he, he sort of takes it in stride. I think he's he's bemused by it. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Cameron is a little like, uh, whoa, 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 good for you, you know. Yeah. I'm training. You know, if I were him, I'd be I'd be pretty upset that nobody had bothered to tell me about this ahead of time. Yeah, he's probably and upset with her for uh, circumventing his. Yeah, chain of command. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Maybe that's what happened. He fired her. Especially, maybe. Or kicked her onto another team. I mean, it definitely sounds a little shady the way all this went down. I'll He's like, that. you go to the team that Frank Gorshin's running. Yeah. And- <laughs> uh, yeah. But it, it, was, it was a little shady. I mean, she's definitely capable, but I question yeah. the circumstances in which she's uh, getting this executive training. Right. <laughs> But hey, more power to her, I guess, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, in the, in the other episode that she, she's in, she actually is like somehow ends up in the field with Lockwood. Yeah. And they definitely get together then. And you know, I should say too, I don't. Uh, you know, the it takes two to tango. So yeah. I have to question the uh, the capabilities of this of WSC here, this World Securities, <laughs> if that's how they're if that's what their employee training consists mm-hmm. of is like spotlighting young blondes. Right. <laughs> You know, picking them out and taking them to dinner and, and grooming them that way for yeah, uh, like what if Corona? promotions to big spots. You know, I mean, she's already got a pretty good you know job. It seems like, like I it. said, we, she's not like a stenographer or or some. She's she's not something like entry level position that they just gave her because she's a woman. They have her in a highly sophisticated uh, thing where she's got to read telemetry and yeah, you know, and make witty comments while doing it and right and then uh, maintain her cool. annoy yeah. Cameron. Yes, annoy Cameron and. <laughs> Occasionally, you know, give Lockwood some 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 business too. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, what I mean, what are these other people going to think? I don't know. Like uh, Corota, that's the only other name I know. With yeah, yeah. Well, I know there's uh, uh, some episodes. A Martinez is is one of those guys. Yes, I can't remember what his. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. A Martinez. I, I can't remember what that. his character name is, but and there's Keach, and then there's the language guy, and yeah, a few other. Yeah. There was definitely a Latino guy in this one, but I forget. And Cameron likes like. calling them all by their last names. Yeah. Including and, the agents. And he's a little condescending to them sometimes. Too. Yeah. Like they're playing these tapes. Like they identify, use facial recognition, which, I mean, you see that on shows now. And I guess if Facebook can see a picture of my dad and think it's me, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is real. Uh, so they're using something and then like the whole, the computer is just like re- playing a recording of like their whole biography. Yeah. Do you really want to play the whole thing or yeah. something? And yeah, every night. he's a little uh, he's a little prickly. Yeah, most of the time he doesn't like time being wasted, especially on by agents out in the field. Right, Lockwood. This is not a social gathering. <laughs> May I remind you, we have work to do. You know, when he's going out to for drinks with uh, 
some uh, sophisticated <laughs> yeah. lady. Uh, Cameron's uh, giving him heck. We're on the we're on a, yeah. <laughs> a, a clock here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course Lockwood and you know pretty much ignores all that. Yeah. Right. But he gets the job done. He does, and then he gets to dance to a bossa nova version of the theme song. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that was a nice. That's a nice touch. Yeah. I love it when the the. I think you and I have talked about how we love it when the show finds an excuse to get a version of the theme song within the show itself. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great example. <laughs> and yeah. that's why, yeah, the, the end of the episode and Cameron's Lockwood. Yeah. Yeah, any... The ideal search episode ends somehow <laughs> like that with, like, cool music being played, Lockwood doing something against so Cameron's orders and Cameron, <laughs> and Cameron, yes, uh, ranting about it over the, yeah. right. you know, the communication line. Lockwood... Blackwood, <laughs> you've turned off your device. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very much reminiscent of some of the James Bond stuff. Actually, mm-hmm. you know, with James Bond, like, you know, turning off the phone or whatever, and yeah, we fade out uh, tastefully, but right, not not really derivative of, of the James Bond stuff, but of the three, uh, Lockwood's the most uh, with his relation to the the women, especially. Yeah, I mean, Lockwood is the, is the one they play up on the the Playboy aspect of it. I think the most. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Grover is not a... I think he does okay, but he's not a playboy, sort of. Yeah, Grover is more like an all-American... He's kind of more like the regular guy Yeah. Uh, kind of thing. And and Bianco's like... He's like macho-sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or something. He's probably like cynical. Yeah. Got a hard shell. Yeah. But uh, soft underneath. Uh, but yeah, Lock, Lockwood's definitely the... the the best. And this is a good episode. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it establishes a lot of this stuff. Uh, I guess. So if you hadn't seen the TV movie, I think it still does a good job of. Yeah. Setting I, things up. I mean, you really wouldn't need to see the TV movie, right? I mean. I kind of almost like the TV movie. I think spends time explaining a lot of the technology. Yeah. And maybe just having seen it, I didn't need it. But here they just explain it when it's necessary. Yeah, I think that's. that's but you kind of get the idea. Right. Like, oh, okay. His ring showing them things, and yeah, and there's no real like serialized elements to to the show. No, uh, I mean we've talked about characters that that come and go and stuff like that, but yeah, but you can just kind of dive in and pick up an episode at a time. Um, I mean, I would definitely say like any Lockwood episode is worth catching. Yeah, and uh, I'm trying to think of other individual. There's the one where they sort of break format when Cameron, the one where Cameron gets kidnapped. Oh right, yeah, and he's actually out of the field for like a long time because yeah you, you have to he's kind of left to his own devices in some ways he's trying to escape and everything and right but a lot of a lot of it yeah like the sort of intrigue and, and i think spy fi was a good description of it that yeah. you gave that yeah and that episode now i'm thinking about was interesting because you get a lot of like his backstory yeah like and he was involved in i don't know the cia or something yeah it was it was definitely uh stood out because a lot of the, you, you don't get a lot of that i mean stuff comes up but yeah. To devote that much time, and, and they, they really made an effort to to tell you more about that character in that one. Yeah, and I think I think it's a Bianco episode is the one that has, like, I think that's the one that has Mary Fran and some other, like, has multiple, like, three or four other probe agents. Yeah. And that was pretty cool in terms of, like, sort of the world building, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, it, it is kind of interesting. There, there, there were definitely a lot of directions they could go, I mean. Yeah. Even if they kept the same, they could, could have kept the same format and had... More interaction with other agents and right. more stories about things happening to agents, I guess. And yeah. The the Grover one I remember is the one with Barbara Feldon uh, and yeah. sort of a uh, a Howard Hughes type figure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's, it's the Lockwood ones that really stand out just because he's, so, yeah. he's so cool. But, uh, but, but it's, it's a great show. Uh, I don't know why I didn't um, have to look up what, what it competed against. I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. It was uh, maybe, matter of fact, I might have my crack research team do that right now. Okay. Why don't you do that? Ah, well, I have the answer as to why search didn't last. Okay. I can give you one word. Yeah. Ipso facto, end of story, the end. Up against uh, search on Wednesday nights on CBS, canon. Oh. There you go. (laughs) I gotta admit, even I would probably watch Canon over even talk. Well, yeah, I don't know about that. So, but. Search was on what network? 
Search was on NBC. Okay. So when when 1972 when Fall started, it had we had the Julie Andrews Hour on ABC right. at 10 p.m. That, that seems weird, doesn't it, for the Julie Andrews Hour? Yeah. Cannon at 10. Uh huh. Cannon, he, you needed to put him at 10. He, he didn't get warmed up until eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night anyway. And then Search at uh, which actually followed uh, an early form of the NBC mystery movie. Oh. With uh, Madigan, Cool Million, and Banachek at that time. Wow. Okay. And so that's actually not, well, actually, I was going to say it wasn't heavyweight uh, competition, but with Canon, I guess it was heavyweight competition. Maybe people didn't watch TV much on Wednesday nights. Hmm. Why would that, why would that be? I don't know. Middle of the week. They're tired. I mean, this is back when, like, Saturday TV was a big thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, I guess maybe it just didn't catch on, or maybe it was one of those things that was, Maybe it was expensive to make, and it just wasn't justifying the the budget or something. I, yeah. don't, I don't know. Maybe they just couldn't take that much cool. Yeah, <laughs> that might have been a problem. Especially because you know, it was, so it was on ten on NBC. Then you know, the Tonight Show was on a little bit later. I mean, could you handle the cool of Lockwood and the cool of Johnny Carson in one night? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I wonder if NBC uh, tried to play that up though. Like they'd have promos with like some seductor, seductive uh, female voice. <laughs> NBC Wednesday nights. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we've got Lockwood and Johnny. <laughs> You've never seen so much plaid in your life. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, I don't know if Lockwood had any plaid on. A lot of brown. He might as well have. Yeah. He could have pulled it off. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he wore a plaid at some point. I'm sure he did. Yeah, so I, I just don't know. It's a, it's a shame because I I find myself wanting to see more of this show, and actually even now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll go and watch some more of these episodes again. But it's 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 cool stuff. Uh, and this episode is a good introduction to the show, although I would definitely recommend, if you can see, catch that two-hour movie, it's it's worth seeing. It's not essential, but it's it's good enough. I mean, that was what really got the whole thing started for us. So Yeah. But all the, the elements, and, and really to me, yeah, like I said, the plots don't stand out. It's the interaction. It's it's Lockwood and interacting with the women. Lockwood, uh, you know, kind of being a tough guy. Yeah. Who was the the woman in the movie? It was somebody in the movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was it was a name uh, actress. I can't remember now. It was an Elka Summer? <laughs> uh, somebody like that. There's somebody like that, I think, but I I don't Hang remember. On. I'm gonna. We'll have the crack research team look into that. And actually, the crack research team is uh, going far afield, much more so than normal in this case. But so, search 1972. <laughs> we have a research team looking at this right now. Yeah, it was Elka Summer. It was Elka Summer. Okay, I apologize for, for doubting it. There was a good pull. A good pull for Lockwood, too. I uh, know. Okay, Summer. Well, Lockwood merits a lot of uh, hey now. So yeah, it was Elka Summer. Yeah. But the TV movie uh, started all. It was good. Uh, try to think if there's there's anything else that uh, that I wrote down that we're missing. All of my notes I've covered, I think. Yeah. I mean, I I think we've learned. You know, Lockwood's cool. Peach Melba is cool. <laughs> I mean, they did they did make another reference later to Peach Melba. There were like they, three at least yeah. three references. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's good stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely urge people to seek this out. And, you know, props to, to Warner Archive. This is the kind of thing, like, some of the stuff, let me just say this, this the what we'd like to see shows, some of these are lost to time forever. Mm -hmm. This show normally would be lost forever, except Warner Archive puts out stuff that they have when they can. Right. I mean, I guess some things they have problems with clearances or something. This one, they put it out, and... I seem to remember when it came out, they talked about uh, this being a labor of love, and mm -hmm. I, I know they've got some some fans in there that, that really tried to put over the show and loved it. And I mean, this is a while ago. I think it's been out like three or four years. But kudos to them for for getting a a one season show like this out on DVD, where anybody can can yeah. purchase it. I also give give them credit for at the end leaving the the old Warner Brothers logo. Yes, like the nineteen seventies one that's all like. You know, curved. Thank you. Yes, old logos rule, and they should be on everything. It's kind of obnoxious. There's certain companies right. that put their new obnoxious uh, logos, slap them at the beginning or end of old shows, and it's very jarring to watch those. I, I don't like that. 
You, yeah. That's even worse. Replacing is the worst. Right. But even slapping those on to some of the other ones is bad enough. Uh, like, I, yeah, I think on the Magnum, that had like a newer Universal yeah, one. Yeah, very distracting. That old Universal one was great. Yeah, like that's that's not how we watch this show. I want to see, no. you know, Night of Broadcast, how we enjoyed it. Yeah. Maybe not with the original commercials, but hey. No, it would be interesting to see some of the commercials. Oh, from I would definitely watch the original yeah. commercials. Yeah, I'd like to see what they were... What they were trying to sell to the man that, that liked Hugh Lockwood. <laughs> Probably some of the products we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I was uh, disappointed. I went to the end and uh, in in credits, there was a credit for uh, his car being supplied by Mercedes. Nice. Although when the, like a, a lot of episodes, like no matter where they go, they somehow end up with the same car. Yeah. Like yeah. this time he was driving some American, like a Mustang or something when he was in D.C. Hmm. But I, I know other ones. Uh, and then each each guy has their own car, like a specific car that you kind of identify them with. Right. But I was hoping there would be like a, like, you know, wardrobe supplied by <laughs> yeah, that... Botany 500 or something. <laughs> no. That's good. That's good that you look for that. I, yeah. I'm disappointed with myself for not, for not doing that. All right. Search. Go watch it. It's cool. Yeah. And I, I wish I could do a better job of being Lockwood if, but... If I were good enough to convey how Lockwood is, I probably wouldn't be here doing a podcast, to be honest with you. I'd That's be right. on a beach somewhere with uh, <laughs> unspecified things by my side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't all be Lockwood, man. No, but we can at least strive to be like Lockwood, and that's yeah. what I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to. More medallions, more turtlenecks. And more Peach Melba. <laughs> This episode brought to you by Corota for Hire. When you need a guy to press a button and relay some information, you need Corota. This episode also brought to you by Box and a Buckle Belts. We provide the box, you provide the lockpicks. This episode also brought to you by World Securities, creators of Probe. <laughs> we said Probe. Join us next time for another exciting episode of Battle of the Network Shows. Learn more, leave feedback, and suggest future episodes at battleofthenetworkshows.com. Follow us on Twitter at BatNetShows, and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash battleofthenetworkshows. Lockwood. Show's over, son. Back to work. Home to father. And your favorite on-the-job trainee.